Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Peter Jubin. The D is silent, like in Django. I don't know if you saw that movie. Very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Peter Francis Jubin writes and speaks on awareness and spirituality. His first book, Consciousness is All, has helped thousands around the world enjoy greater clarity, happiness, and freedom. Peter's work benefits so many because it is not tied to any teaching or religion. He has studied this field for over 40 years since attending the University of Notre Dame. He also worked many years in corporate America, now resides in Arizona. Peter enjoys the outdoors, as do I. I just don't get enough of it. <laughs> so, uh, true, true. Yeah. So uh, 40 years. So let's, let's sketch through those 40 years quickly before okay. we get into the meat of what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. I, I just recall uh, when at the University of Notre Dame, I think it was a freshman, and uh, took a philosophy course as an elective, one of those things. And uh, it was actually, it was Eastern philosophy. And in that, we, uh, one of the books we read was the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. And there was another one I can't remember the title of even, but having been raised Roman Catholic, and there I am at the University of Notre Dame, um, there was just a feel to what was said in those pages. That's, that's all I can do is an ease to it. And not so much of the guilt kind of motivation type thing. So uh, that was very appealing, even though it didn't really fully register at the time. Like, you got to really check this out. So um, anyway, one thing led to another. I went to work in uh, corporate America. I didn't really have anything I wanted to do, but well, everybody gets out of college and gets a job. So that's what you do. And I, you know, went in the business world outwardly pretty, you know, apparently successful and had all the right things and all that, but really didn't feel fulfilled or, you know, was feeling like this is all there is or I, I, I don't want to do this kind of thing. So uh, I was bored too, really bored. Um, and sometimes on my lunch break, I would go in bookstores. I was working right in Midtown Manhattan and um, I found my, you know, I'd poke around and I eventually found my way over to, I guess today we would call it uh, personal growth or self-help and read all the books by uh, Napoleon Hill. And um, Think and Grow Rich. Yes. And who was the uh, power of positive thinking? Uh, man? I can't remember his name right now. Yeah. And the, the, there's even a church for that he started in uh, lower, lower Manhattan there. Um, it'll Nor come to Norman Every, Vincent Peale? Norman Vincent Peale, yeah. yes. So it was that, and then um, other books, a few, and you know how we've all done, you pick up one, something, as we say, resonates, and you pick up another one, nothing resonates, so you put that one down and you just keep looking, keep looking. And uh, I went on from there to things like uh, religious science, science of mind, and um, that's what primarily had my interest. One day, I was in a bookstore in Manhattan, a spiritual bookstore, and found a book, it was a little book, uh, called The Infinite Way by Joel Goldsmith. Um, I'm sure some of your viewers are, are familiar with that too. And um, that just blew everything else out of the water for me. I don't, I don't mean that in a negative, compare, you know what I mean, comparative way, but it just, whoa, this is it. And so I, I stayed with that for... Uh, a number of years, I can't remember how many, and I thought, you know, there's nothing beyond this, this is it. Uh, I had the good fortune to know a teacher in New York, a woman named Lorene McClintock, who had studied for years directly with Joel Goldsmith, and uh, just being able to go to her classes uh, from time to time, and workshops, was a great thing. So, that was going on, and uh, I, at times too, I would go to uh, uh, Sri. Is it Chinmoy? Chin Chinmoy. 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 Um, he was in New York and was active for a while, and I would go to med meditation classes that he has, and I really enjoyed those. And again, there was a for me a distinctive peace 
and an ease present that wasn't always present with everything else. In the others, there was a, a lot of a sense of me, even though I didn't realize it at the time, a lot of a sense of me, got to do something, got to get there, got to whatever. And um, anyway, one day uh, I heard through a friend about a book on infinite reality and uh, from a friend, and that just stuck in my thought and wouldn't go away. And it just felt real. Sometimes people call it absolute reality. I, I avoid using the word absolute just because it gets into too many debates kind of things. I don't, I don't like to, to use it, and it gets you know intellectual. And um, anyway, I thought, I've got to check this out. And eventually I did and found the work of a man named Alfred Aiken, who wrote, he was on the scene in uh, mostly in New York. He lived in the late 1950s and 1960s. And um, in his first book, which was titled That Which Is, first one I read, in I believe it's in chapter one, there was a statement, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, reality is a matter of looking out from God rather than as a separate self looking up to God. And right there, that was one of those whammo <laughs> moments. And so much stuff fell away with that. And I could just see with, with everything else, there was always this middleman me who had to be as conscious as consciousness itself. Uh, you know, with my so-called personal mind or consciousness. And it just flipped everything around. It was like, my gosh, of course, who the heck else is conscious but consciousness itself? It's already had itself. You, it's impossible to have it any other way. And so uh, the, and the, the amazing thing about his books is that they were written as if it were the self, the one, love, the infinite, talking only about itself to itself and it doesn't leave any room for a you that's got to do this it's got to do that and that took a little getting used to you know it part of part of you is going this is it this is it I have no idea what this is saying but I know this is it <laughs> kind of thing and then you know eventually you see that wherever there was a a, a misunderstanding or something wasn't clear it's was like oh yeah I'm implying that there's a me again that has to, you know, see this, do this, get, do something. So, okay, that was pretty much it. Yeah. Huh. And then, of course, you've gone on to do a lot since then. But um, just maybe before we go on, this this thing of looking out from God, and maybe this will segue us into the rest of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a looking out from God, but it's through the instrumentality of a human nervous system. Uh, you know, which is sort of like a sense organ of the infinite, we could say. Um, and uh, so isn't the looking out necessarily um, filtered or conditioned or influenced by, uh, you know, because yeah. if you really had God's perspective, you'd probably see all the oh. subatomic particles and the galaxies, and, you, you know, there'd be yeah. this sort of complete yeah, comprehension of I, everything, I, omniscience, yeah. you know? Those, any, any words we say are, are going to be, you know, <laughs> um, flawed in some way. Uh, but... A big part of it is that the, the, the emphasis is on always what, right, right now, for example, being is being. Life is alive. Absolutely unthinkable how that is functioning. You know, to, it can't be grasped. And yet, here it is. And so it's that unthinkableness it's it's not a matter when, but even the looking out from implies another to be doing that kind of uh in a sense and it, it in the deepest deepest sense there's only pure being there's only the infinite which does not coexist with a finite state or a state of space and time uh and so there's nothing to do. And I mean, obviously, that seems a far cry from what appears to be our relative experience. But it's, it's the, um, the immediacy and, and the unthinkableness and the formlessness of it. 
uh, mostly immediacy. That is is the only you know word that comes in my thought right now to to attempt to point to it. And that's all there is. Done. 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 And anything that starts to talk or argue to the contrary, we're back in thought in some way, shape, or form, or or in uh, you know a feeling. Even it might be a very fine, fine, subtle feeling. Um, and the moment that's happened or that that thought has arisen, that's all fumes. That's exhaust. You know, there's nothing really in that thought. It's already gone, and that, that's how instant and immediate, immediate it is. And that's all that is. So, yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Not that my agreement really matters in terms of the way reality functions. But, uh, you know, I mean, we could just by example, we could take anything such as your book. And, you know, if, if we see this as something other than pure being, we're not looking closely enough because a physicist would tell us, okay, you just go deeper, deeper, deeper into this and you get to the point yeah, where it's all right. just unmanifest. You know, there, yes, there is no exactly. paper, there is no, there is no carbon in this, you know. Exactly. But, but then again, in the very same breath, um, you know, if there's a book, you'd probably like people to buy it. And it consists of paper and carbon yep. and all. At least, took time to write it. At least on an apparent, yeah, it took time to write it and, and you know, you get money for it and blah, 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 a million implications. So on, on an apparent level, even though we can always sort of dismiss the, the appearances and boil them down to nothingness, we live in a, in a world of books and people and cars and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, apparent things that we have to interact with. Um, so, you know, some people jump to the gun and, and say... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, none of this is ultimately real, therefore none of it matters. And, oh, yeah. And they kind of wipe the slate clean of all sort of moral implications and, you know, com yeah. compassionate yeah. action and all that other stuff because it's all unreal, so why bother? You know, like, like someone said at the SAND conference last year, who cares about the ecology? The world is like nothing, you know, speck of sand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that you know, always bugs me a bit. That's, a, you know, that's a great point. And I've found, because... Of talking this way in workshops, or sometimes you know when it's more a open thing, and there are, there are folks there who aren't as familiar with the perspective, fully familiar with it. Let's say what happens often is that. Um, well, let me back up a minute. The the so so to speak, the premise of consciousness is all that book and Aiken's work is the allness of life, the allness of, if you want to call it love, of, of fresh aliveness, of purity, of, of oneness, the utterness of oneness, leave it right there kind of thing. But what happens is, um, and, and I know because I experienced it myself, and I think all of us have, is because it seems we are used to dealing with uh, the apparent world, the manifest world, then when you hear something like that, there's a tendency to think, Oh, that just wipes this out, or it's not here, or it's, it doesn't matter, nothing matters, so what the hell kind of thing. But that is leaving the emphasis on the apparent and, and is, is not really seeing the beauty of the wholeness, the, the immediacy of, of, of oneness, of life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's so easy to, to uh, get on the negation side of it or you know see things in that way and um anyway i'm just glad you said that because that's a very important part and we often and generally when people are still, doing that in my opinion they're they're sort of in their heads they're kind of intellectualizing yes. the, the oneness of all and they oh yeah they haven't kind of integrated it experientially yeah exactly i mean th this uh if i may say something else too um it's a good at this point i think it's easy because we deal on a constantly all day long in this realm of the apparent and the manifest to think in those terms. And right now, for example, for those who uh, are watching this video, this, this conversation, it might be easy to think of this as what's being said right now as between two people. One in, one in Arizona, one in Iowa. That's certainly how it appears. And yet, in another sense, it can be said that it's thanks to the presence of this all-embracing, infinite, boundless, perfectly whole consciousness 
this, this, this oneness, that any of this can be said, and it really is the one being conscious right now, even right where the viewer appears to be. And, you know, so, so these words of our conversation, I just like to emphasize, should really be heard not as the voice of Rick and the voice of Peter, but the voice of consciousness talking. And it's not taking place on a, on a physical planet, you know, and, and there's no space and no time between consciousness and its own presence right now. And so it will give listening as if it were that one. And this, it's this very same consciousness that is the consciousness of the viewer, so to speak, because there's only the one. And that will give an entirely different takeaway or feel to what's being said rather than, you know, hearing it only on the level of an exchange of two bodies. Certainly appears that way, of course, yeah. obviously, but it's just a different take. So. And when you anyway. say that, then in the very same breath, you know, I'm tempted to say, yeah, but if I want to come and visit you in Arizona, I've got to book a plane oh, yeah. ticket, and that's going to be for a couple weeks at least in the future, and then I'm going to drive to the airport, and I'm going to fly to Arizona. So there's going to be all this relative stuff going on to yes. facilitate uh, that on the level of appearances. And, yep. um, and we, you know, so from my perspective... Um, really, spiritual development entails not negating or dismissing or wiping away any uh, of the apparent realms of life, but really more of an integration into a larger wholeness where everything sort of has its place. And, you know, even while uh, acknowledging the ultimate unreality of all these relative things, you, you function in the midst of them and, and, and with them and... and uh, you know, in a, in a yeah. capable way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and that's why uh, it, it things appear harmoniously too. Uh, you know, w oneness, the the singleness, the allness of consciousness, being one. It, it, it if you want to use words, uh, it's got to be harmonious because you need you need two to have opposition or mm -hmm. to have friction or you know any of those things. Even though that's certainly all over the place in the mm -hmm. apparent, but. Um, like you say, in the clarity that, okay, it's really consciousness that is the one who's conscious here, the one, and yet it appears that all these things still have to be done with the body and time and space, uh, but it's sort of that clarity and abiding as that, as we say, that makes for a more harmonious apparent experience because there, there isn't the sense of two, which all was just like a belief, really. Right. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just a, a mental thing. So, And of course you and Aiken and anybody else uh, hasn't originated this way of understanding or the world. I mean, the, no. it, go, it goes back thousands of years. We have the Upanishad saying all this is that and, you know, phrases like that. And, mm. uh, and actually, uh, speaking of the Upanishads, the, the Vedic perspective has a, kind of a handy concept to understand what we're just talking about, which is the, the, the term mitya, which means dependent reality. And they use, the example oh. of, they use the example of a pot. So you have a pot, but it's really only clay. It's not a pot, it's clay, you know. And you, but it functions as a pot. You can do things with it, you know. You put beans in it or something. But the, the potness is kind of dependent on, on the fundamental on, reality of clay. On the clay, yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. And so with, as, you're, as you're saying, all this relative stuff is consciousness is all. Your book title said... Uh, true, acknowledged, but um, there's a sort of dependent reality or parent reality that we live in uh, that is really only consciousness, but mm -hmm. you always have to say but, you know, because... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. When speaking that way, yeah, you have to. Right. It's like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth a lot of the time, you know, it seems that way. Yeah, and I think that's the name of the game is to kind of learn to... Um, incorporate this paradox, this paradoxical situation within one's living experience and, and not to be intellectualizing it all the time, not like you're right. running, running around all day thinking, oh, this is only consciousness and that is only consciousness, but you know, <laughs> the experience yeah. can actually de develop to the point where you actually perceive things in terms of the self or in terms of consciousness. You know, you see the book, but it's seen in terms of that oneness. Uh, yeah. Without having to think about it in the least, I mean. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I mean, you know, presence itself, consciousness itself, never, never says anything, and so it certainly or or thinks 
So it never certainly thinks, well, this is all just an illusion. You know, it, it never says that or, yeah. or that's separate. Oh, but now it's not separate or, you know, whatever. Yeah, so. yeah. It's, so I guess the point we're making here is that, you know, for all this stuff to be a, a living reality and have some real value rather than just being a philosophical exercise, uh, it really has to be sort of incorporated into one's blood and bones, so to speak, in, as a, you know, a kind of a solid living reality. Right. And, and, and as such, it's not going to be something that you're running around thinking about all day long. It's going to no. be something that is the nature of your experience, whether you're eating or sleeping or falling off a bicycle or, you know, whatever is happening to you, uh, that that reality is solid. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's more a matter of uh, in in the book, Consciousness is All, it uses the term conscious aliveness mm -hmm. a lot. And it's a matter of, and it's consciousness that is being alive as that aliveness, not Peter, uh, but it's a matter of conscious aliveness rather than thinking about conscious aliveness. Yeah. And of course, yeah, there's, there's so this kind of a premise among, um, uh, based on this whole thing you're saying, which is, and there's an argument in scientific realms, you know, is consciousness just an epic phenomenon of brain functioning or is consciousness fundamental and gives it rise to the brain and everything else? And I think you and I would probably argue the second uh, second thing. And oh, we, totally. Yeah. yeah, and we don't have to yeah. dwell on that forever. Maybe you know, physicists and so on might be better qualified or neurophysiologists. But um, but that's the premise here: is that consciousness is a fundamental reality. It's not just some kind of chemical production of, that's happening in brains. No. It's it's the sort of the the ultimate reality of the universe, and uh, and somehow within that, everything appears to arise. Yeah, I didn't say from that because that would apply that it kind of separates from it as it arises. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. All right, so I'm getting a little preachy here, and uh, this, <laughs> this, this interview is about you. But um, you know, you've written Consciousness is All, you wrote Simply Notice, and and you made a very nice series of uh, YouTube videos about time, which I mm -hmm. I listened to all of them. And so mm -hmm. let's kind of discuss all the points you bring out in those three things and other things as well, if there's something else I'm unaware of. But, um, sure. And you can help me determine which order you'd like to unfold all that. Um, let me say this at the outset, since you, you just held that up a minute ago. Uh, for, again, for those watching, maybe those who are familiar with the book Consciousness is all already, uh, simply notice the the new book, which was just released uh, within the last couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you. Um, is a very different book. It is. I wouldn't. Most of your viewers are, as we were saying earlier, are seasoned spiritual non-dual folks, for want of a better way of saying it. And uh, the book simply notice is written in a very different way. It is very simple, very basic. You. The word notice is in the title because as you go through the pages, you notice one thing on every page, and that's it. And it's about awareness, about uh, love, about what you consider yourself to be, the difference between awareness and what appears to be a body, and so on. But it is written to uh, make maybe hopefully some of these deeper points accessible to a much, much wider audience range of readers, people who maybe get turned off by certain types of terms or, you know, coming out with these grandiose statements, even though they might be true, or, you know, right off the bat. Um, so for those who, you know, are, we've mentioned the book, I just would like everyone to be aware of it, particularly if they've read a lot of spiritual and non-dual literature. And if you're thinking it's the latest, next great latest thing along the line, it's not that. So... One thing you say in the book is, uh, maybe it's in the introduction or something, you say, the very power of noticing led to something huge during the early writing mm. of this book. What was that? Mm -hmm. um, and again, just sort of keeping it in thought that the book is written to hopefully a wide audience. Um, terms like universal consciousness, they've been around a long time. And some people get it, some people don't, a lot of people don't care about it, or it's just too woo-woo, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but um, another way of saying that, and uh, especially when you do some of the 
deconstruction noticing exercises about what seem to be material objects, uh, including Earth, uh, is one of them. That it's just you know sensation, perception, mentation, as they say, um, and there's no object really separate out there anywhere in a in a physical or material realm, but. Another way of saying that is that life is not on Earth. Life is not on Earth. And uh, another thing it says in the book is that today you go out on the street and you ask 99 out of 100 people, is life on Earth? Yeah, of course it is. What are you, crazy? You know, and maybe it's on other planets too, but... Uh, Maybe not. We don't know that. But there's always the issue of on, and that implies, uh, you know, objectiveness and again, physicality, materiality, and this belief. What I what I tried to say in the book to sort of give it a perspective, and um, kind of a, a quick way of grasping the whole notion is that the current belief today that life is on Earth is our era's version of the flat Earth. It really is. And we don't like to think, even people who are not spiritually minded, nobody likes to think that they're being duped every minute of every day by an illusion, just the way the flat earth folks were. Or, you know, they thought the, the universe was geocentric and everything, all the planets and the sun and the stars all rotate around earth. That's certainly how it appears. But then you get a different perspective, a different model, thanks to Galileo and Columbus and blah, blah. Um, and there's this huge shift and it seems in, you know, general public, uh, we're laboring under a similar, similar thing with this belief of objectification and physicality and life being on. And so I, I really wanted to try and, you know, make that point in the book and, and, and because I think it's a good way to, again, shift shift out of that okay so what are we shifting to if life on earth is the flat earth view what is the round earth view um all there is is consciousness and even what appears as the manifest and even as an earth is in this uh infinite boundless uh single one only uh life consciousness you can call it love, whatever whatever term you want. That is infallibly present. That's that it itself is perfect. It never screws up. It doesn't make mistakes, uh, and that is the very, really the substance, in which all existing appears to go on. And there's a vast difference when that is clear and that is sort of lived in terms of how things manifest, still appear, they're still going to appear, but that's very different from seeing everything through a filter of that separate, and I've got this, you know, feeling of uh, resentment against that one, and I'm criticizing that one because they're all separate from me, and I'm a separate self too, and this whole God thing, you know, he's he doesn't like me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so from uh, that perspective, then, we wouldn't ask, is there life on Mars? We would say... Exactly. You know, so Mars and everything, as well as everything else, is pure, yes. pure life. And you know, maybe the conditions there aren't conducive to biological life, but nonetheless, essentially, it's the same pure consciousness that everything exactly. else is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, because even if the body were somehow able to go to Mars, what would that experience consist of? Presence. Nothing, yes, Pure consciousness. and even even on even on the manifest level, all it would be at most would be some type of sense perception. It would still boil down to the same things, you know, hearing, uh, feeling, tasting. I don't know what you'd taste, but you know, uh, the visual and so De on. Dehydrated and, meals, no doubt. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that would be it. And apart from those, which is which is in one sense, just you know thought, all thought, or so-called mental, and apart from that, there is no physical object Mars, and, and none of it could occur outside of or beyond what this thing we call consciousness. So, um, and you know, even the, the whole universe, in, 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 in com comparison to the measurelessness 
utter measurelessness of consciousness itself, even what appears as a universe full of these galaxies and inestimable light years is like a, a pinprick against the, the, the vastness and the openness and the freedom and the, and the peace. So Yeah. Here, I'm with you. <laughs> um, there was a, I don't know if this was in your book or in the uh, videos we listened to, and I don't want to throw you off track by jumping around no. too much, but um, no, that's fine. You, you were saying that um, you were kind of giving the impression that things don't exist until we perceive them. Uh, you know, like, you know, I have a car in the garage, but it doesn't exist until I go out in the garage and perceive the car. And, um, you know, I didn't completely swallow that. So you want to, like, okay. let's talk about that oh, a little sure. bit. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and by the way, that happens to be, and I didn't know this uh, at the time. This, this is coming from the experiential side, mm -hmm. obviously. But um, that is perfectly consistent with what basically quantum theory is all about. And the, uh, it's been so long since I, lo since I looked at them. But they do, they've done these experiments with, with the wave and the particle. Yeah, and Heisenberg's the uncertainty slit. principle, where it's, uh, the, the photon isn't, is That's neither right. a particle nor a wave until you perceive it, I guess, and then it kind of That's collapses right. into one or the other. That's right. But there is, until that observer is there to observe it, uh, there is no manifestation. Here's why I have there a problem is, with that. It's dependent it, on the observer being there. Yeah. Here's why I okay. have a problem with that. Um, you used the word geocentric a little while ago, you know, which was the notion that the Earth is the center of everything, the whole universe. And uh, this sounds kind of geocentric, too, in a sense. Uh, 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 not geocentric, more like anthropocentric, where um, it's as if objective reality really depends upon our individual personal perspective, and yet... Uh, obviously, there is a universality to the structure of creation, which doesn't which doesn't really rely on any one individual. And I used this example in a I think it was Gary Weber interview a couple of months ago, where uh, you know, you, when we all go to sleep at night, all seven billion of us, we dream different things, and we really can't participate in one of those dreams. But when we wake up, we can all look up and see the moon, and it's the same moon, more or less, even though we might perceive it somewhat okay. differently. So yeah. there's a kind of a cons and the moon's been there for so many billion years, and and you know the next generation will see the moon also. So there's a sort of a stability or a, an objectivity to creation, which doesn't matter what you know you and I die tomorrow or anything else. You know what I mean? <clears throat> uh, I have an answer to okay. that, yeah. or, or, or a response. You may not care to agree with it. I, you know, I've I've got no agenda here. I just put it, it out there. Forth. Yeah, or or the uh, you know the, the some of those uh, some of our friends who are viewing this. But all of what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. or and it seems this is where it gets weird or or hard hard to talk about. And it seems as if it's the same for what appears as Peter, but. To, let's say, the Rick experience of appearance and manifestation and form or and even sleeping, within that bubble of experience, it appears as if there are many others there, other bodies, and they talk. They appear animated, and they appear, and they will say things like, I dream too, and I see the moon too, and yet... None, none, none of that exists apart from what appears to be the finite Rick mind. None of it. And if you say, no, 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 Peter is in Arizona and he is there with his own body mind too, you never, ever can prove that. I cannot prove that there is a Rick Archer in Iowa separate from what appears as the Peter dream, if you want to say it that way, or the Peter state of thought. Never, ever, and never, ever is it possible to find another consciousness there. And I'm not saying that the consciousness here is Peter's personal consciousness. It's consciousness consciousness. You can't, you can't, um, in, in uh, just like geocentric, um, in, in I think both the books, it says consciousness is not body centric either. Uh, you know, so anyway, if you, I would say to anyone who's skeptical about that, 
just inquire and see if it's possible to find evidence of, of any of that apart from what appears as the Peter mine. I do it all the time, and it, it's, it's not. Okay. Um, so I still don't get it, but I want to keep working at it with you here. Um, sure. Let's say uh, the, um, it's, it seems to me that you're conflating the universality and omnipresence of consciousness with the... Um, the sort of uh, individuation and localization of relative creation, and you're kind of making the the uh, very existence of creation and its and the laws of nature which govern it dependent upon, in some way, um, each individual's uh, perception of them. Well, you got to come back to: Are there really individuals? Yes and no. Are there really? We kind of covered that at the beginning. There are and there aren't. Um, but, you know, uh, and if we say there aren't... But on, on the level, <laughs> even of the apparent level, where they do appear, all of that is going on within or as the one state of thought or mind or whatever you want to call it that appears to observe it. And to attempt to say, you know, again... Yes, but there are others out there who also, the only evidence of any such thing is still all going to be the content of that same one mental state that appears to be observing it. And it, it's actually, that is that, that is manifesting as that. None of it is separate from that, you know, mental state. But if we say there are no individuals, then we're kind of referring to the, to the level of reality in which there's also no universe. Uh, it, nothing has manifested, nothing has happened. Uh, and as soon as you get into manifestation, through which you know, as physicists talk about sequential spontaneous symmetry breaking, where the, the homogeneous oneness of life begins to bifurcate and individuate, and you have the four fundamental forces, and then from there more complex forces, and the whole thing just gets more and more individuated, uh, you know, that from the moment that begins to happen, you have diversity and, indivi and individuation. Um, and again, you know, you can take it in terms of physics and take, take it from anywhere on that, you know, increasing, you know, scale of complexity and boil it right back down to nothingness. But if, uh, but I think it seems to me what you're do doing is kind of mixing the, the oneness and, and the manyness um, and saying that the, the very existence of the manyness is dependent upon the perception of, you know, this particular perceiving mechanism, you know, Peter's perceiving, me you know, Rick's perceiving mechanism. Oh, no, no oh, not really, because the Peter mechanism, uh, I, that's why in the book, uh, Consciousness is All, it uses the term dream mm -hmm. um, to get away a little bit from body-mind, uh, because it, I know from a certain perspective, things seem to operate on that basis, but... It's not Peter that's dreaming up this dream of manifest form and appearances. Okay. Peter is a product of it. Part of the dream. Peter, yes, he's yeah. a product of it. Not. Okay. Uh, he's a dream character, but he's not. Yes. He's not the dreamer. He's not, exactly. Okay. Exactly. He's a puppet entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, Everything, again, that appears to go on within the framework of a dream, it's like this is a, a silly little uh, example, but when we're asleep, and these things, you know, they're not perfect, but when, when asleep and having a sleeping dream, and there appear to be a lot of different characters in that dream, maybe animals, maybe mountains and trees that, you know, appear to be alive, etc., when you, when, when awakening from that dream, all the others in the dream, that were in the dream, don't awaken also. There's just one. And then, of course, where it falls down is when the awakening, the awakened state appears to be very similar to the types of forms and things that were going on in the dream state, too. And that's not what we really, really mean by awakening, of course. But um, I, I just keep coming back to it's important 
not, just not possible to find any evidence of anything apart from that one dream. And even within the dream, it will say things like, but scientists say, and look, and here's the evidence, and, you know, so on and so on. And this expert over here told me, but it still all appears within the framework of that, that one. Okay. So you just kind of acknowledged when I said, you know, that you're a character in the dream, but not the dreamer. So, you know, and Hindus have this iconography of Vishnu lying on the serpent couch and a lotus coming out of his navel and Brahma on the lotus and, you know, this whole kind of like mythology about how creation comes about. But I, I think the point of it is the idea that the whole creation is kind of God's dream. Uh, and You hear that a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but this kind of makes sense in, in light of what we're saying, I think, because uh, what I was trying to say is that there seems to be a, a consistency to the dream, which is not dependent upon any individual's perspective or perception. Um, like the world wasn't flat when people thought it was, it was really round, and, and their, their realizing it was round didn't make it round. You know, it was what it was, regardless of people's understanding of the, of the topography or the geography. Um. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's where it gets really strange, in a sense, too. Um, so just, the, just let me finish the thought. Yes, so in sure. the context of this larger dream, in which we, you and I, and everyone else is a dream character, um, you know, if, I, if I'm having a dream at night, and there are other people in it with me, and one of them dies uh, in the dream, then, you know, that doesn't sort of end the dream, the dream still going on with its larger context. So, you know, this kind of like dream universe that we live in, if we want to call it that, um, has its structure and its consistency and it's the laws of physics and biology and everything else that enable it to operate. Um, and those things are kind of uh, larger than any individual's perspective on or understanding of them. Uh, it, it just keeps rolling. Um, so, so that's the point. I, I, just that as, okay. as I listened to you, I kind of made it, it made, you made it sound that, like this uh, anthropocentric perspective that things uh, come into existence and disappear according to our, each of our individual perspectives. And I'm suggesting that there's a kind of a larger template or structure uh, within which we operate and that, you know, that it, in, in and of itself may be a total dream ultimately, but it is not dependent upon our no understanding not. or perspective oh, no. or functioning no. or anything else for its no. uh, its stability and existence sure, sure. Okay. yeah and even even what you know and i'm sure you've heard this too i'll, I'll just bring it up because it comes with my thought but even what i would tend to think is okay now uh i peter have free will and i can choose to do as i you know whatever i think and I can hold this bottle in my left hand or I can hold it in my right hand. And I made that choice. And even the uh, neuroscientists now have evidence that the impulse to do that actually occurred before the thought registers to do it. Yeah. And so that just shows that how much the body, what, what the body appears to happen with the body is, again, a puppet of this whole energy soup that, you know, appears to manifest as all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yeah. I'm good with that. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and there are people who, you know, there are people who insist uh, that their experience is very much the case, that they are not doing anything, and that it's all just kind of on automatic. I was talking to a guy last night, and he was saying, like, I don't brush my teeth. God brushes the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So it just kind of depends on where you where the Why focal. Why does God get cavities? Then? Yeah, really. Where is the, it? Sort of depends on where the focal point is. You know, um, where you yep. where you take your stand. Yeah. And, and again, that's not something you can necessarily intellectualize yourself out of. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's probably going to be something that might take <laughs> years to develop in um, in a in a really genuine way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's, for a moment, if we can, talk yeah, sure. about uh, one of the main points, and, and it touches on some of the things you just brought up, too. Um, one of the sort of the main points of those timeout videos, and really, for my money, it's the main point in consciousness is all, too, uh, about what appears as time, what, yeah. we, what we call time. And then after that, 
hopefully if, if I can say this in a way that's clear, uh, let's come back to this notion of the manifest is uh, God's play. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Speaking uh, of time, I heard a great quote from Yogi Berra this morning. He said, the future ain't, <laughs> the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> he was amazing. <laughs> no. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, for, I, I'm thinking this coming to my thought in terms of those who are listening or watching and have not done any deconstruction of what appears to be solid material objects. This ain't going to have a whole lot of significance. So that's one thing that is essential seems to be for this to be clear. Uh, otherwise, it's just not going to click and like, oh my God, yeah, I can see that. But when deconstruction is done, and I know some of the guests you've had on have done a lot of that stuff. Greg Good comes to, comes to my thought, for example, and Rupert Spira and um, uh, Scott Killaby at times, and I'm sure many others. In Consciousness is All, there's a um, chapter titled Check the Credentials, and it uses an example of an apple. And it, without going into all the details, it walks through an experiential, very experiential, not, not you, you do this for yourself, not, not intellectual or conceptual, that <clears throat> what appears on one level to be a separate apple out there has no existence as a standalone object it, because all the evidence for Apple is a visual image, a tactile feel, a, uh, a sound maybe if a bite were taken and there's a crunch, uh, a, um, what am I leaving out? A taste, obviously taste, and then um, scent. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a, we would say a pleasant scent. Now, you say, okay, that's all the, if you, if you really work through and look closely, that is all the evidence there is for an apple or any, any, any so-called physical material object, even this thing, mm -hmm. anything, even earth, is what seems to come by way of the five senses. Sure, and, and our extensions of them through various scientific instruments. You know, you could look at the apple under a microscope or analyze, yeah. analyze its DNA or whatever, but you're, yes. you're still doing that through senses. Exactly, exactly. And even what the scientists call cosmic background radiation for, for the proof of a Big Bang mm -hmm. is still inseparable from the senses. And so what that's another way of saying is that it's what appears as manifest really truly is all, for want of a better word, mental or like a dream. It's not solid stuff. Um, if, if anyone had a sleeping dream or think of a sleeping dream, <clears throat> excuse me, in recently in which maybe there was a, a maybe what you call your own body or a person body in that dream and maybe there's a tree nearby and whatever in within the framework of the dream it seems like there's a real body there and that body has a mind and intelligence inside it because it talks it's animated and it can move and that a tree appears to be growing and yet when you wake up there's nothing to that body that was in the dream. There's no stuff there. There's no physical form. It's, it's like a wispy little thing that has no depth or distance to it, so there's no solid head there. Uh, any more than the, the uh, movie characters on a movie screen that appear that are projected, they don't have solid physical heads. You know, there's nothing there. And so there's nothing in which a mind could be put, nor, could, nor is there a solid tree there in which there could be any life. It all appears, to, it's, you got to have a different way of, you know, describing it or looking at it. So um, <clears throat> that is, appears to be the case for everything in what we call our manifest experience. Everything is just thought or this mental, or if you want to say, like a dream. Now... <clears throat> If you come back to pure consciousness, pure awareness, that which is aware and which is not any of this moving stuff, what seems to move, awareness or, or consciousness always, always, always is present tense. Always. It can't be moved back to, you know, even for those watching, try right now to make this awareness you're presently aware of being. 
try to back it up to two seconds ago. Or, you know, make a jump ahead to two, two seconds ahead. Can't do it. So, and that's you. Not you in a personal way, but that is the one who's aware right now. So, th so this even can be heard. Um, that's the one who's, who's, who's conscious and alive and functioning. Now, if you, when, when it's clear that what appears as manifestation is really inseparable from thought, I'll use the word thought, um, and you really look closely at that, the more you do, it becomes obvious, well, wait a minute. If I try to say, for example, that there was a time, say 15 minutes ago, when the Rick body and the Peter body apparently were talking about other things, actually the only place that is found is not back there, but as a thought arising right now, to what to this present awareness the way the awareness is always present and the thought is only coming up right now and then another thought will try to say oh no no, no well, wait a minute well, wait a minute but there was a uh time this morning before uh we got on skype and there was a time earlier that morning when we had breakfast and there were in fact um several years prior in which rick got this fantastic website started and has had done all these interviews and all those bodies have appeared to go on to do all these wonderful things and some of them appear to have aged a little bit and whatever and Few of yet them died. <laughs> yeah and yet it is impossible and I urge anyone who's skeptical about this to really look don't take my word for this but look for yourself it is impossible to find any evidence for that apart from current thought you can go as far back but there was a big bang which made the universe or there was a time when it was believed that earth was flat and now it's been seen to be round that is not back there it's only current thinking imagining there is oldness because it's fooled by this sensory illusion of separateness if nothing if nothing in what appears as form has its own existence apart from thought, which it doesn't, then it's not there when it's not being thought. It doesn't exist. Okay, so how would you respond if I say, all right, when we look at the moon and ha the, what we're seeing ha happened two seconds ago, and we look at the sun, that happened nine minutes ago, and we're looking at stars that happened hundreds of years ago, and how do you fit that into what you're saying now? Uh, it all comes back to the same thing. It, it appears, the only way I can, and the best way I have of trying to explain it, is that the way the dream appears to work, I almost wrote a chapter, uh, or titled a chapter in Simply Notice, but I felt it was getting into a little deep water for what the rest of the book was about. It was, was going to be called Instant Mountains. Mm -hmm. And what it was, is um, I'll make a little analogy. Suppose you had a sleeping dream, and uh, the head... You're tired, the head hits the pillow, and within a matter of moments, you're fast asleep, and a dream kicks in. And in that dream, suddenly Rick is in the Swiss Alps, and uh, there's a beautiful lake there, and uh, the, the cows are in the pasture on the mountainside, and the bells are ringing, and all these other things. In the distance, you can see the snow-capped mountains, some beautiful fir trees, and all that. Now... And, a, and let's say you were on vacation with a friend of yours who's a geologist. And you would say, you know, Rick, those mountains were formed in the, I, I can't remember. Right. since Millions, so of, billions of years ago or whatever. Yes, yeah. formed. And, you know, the, the, the plates of the earth and the crust shifted and all that. Um, and isn't that, isn't that amazing? Okay. Now, you wake up from the dream. It all appeared instantly, but how old did were there really millions of years in that dream? No, it appeared instantly, the whole thing, and the story to back it up, which was part of the same dream. And even if, even if your scientist, geologist friend, did some carbon dating while you were there and scraped a rock or something and said it would be, the whole thing would be inseparable from that dream state, and the dream state just popped up on the instant with it somehow... It, it, that's one of the wonders and the paradoxes. It produces this seeming evidence that seems to 
corroborate this story of its having had this long prior background. But you, it's impossible to find any, any of it apart from back there. Even the thought, what I had all these dreams before. I've been dreaming since I was a kid. Where is it? Your, your so-called kid experience was all mental, even when it was so, it wasn't physical, it wasn't separate, and uh, even when it was so-called happening, but actually, all the evidence there is for that, too, is that it's not, it's not back there. It's just thought. Everything is thought. And when it's not, um, okay, yeah, if, if uh, to go back to uh, consciousness is all, and the example of the apple, if there literally, truly is no apple apart from the sensations of it or sense perceptions of it, which, again, I'll say is like a mental thing. It's made out of thought. It, in in, in uh, uh, Eastern teachings, they, they call – they have two types of referring to the, the, the apparent or the manifest. It's like if I think of the letter A, that's – just think of it. That's called a subtle thought. And – if I were to cut a, a block of wood in the shape of a letter A, that would be called a gross thought because it seems to be more substantial than the, the, the letter A that I've just thought of. But ultimately, that so-called wood letter A does not exist apart on its own as an object from the mind's observation of it or sense perceptions. There is no separate object there. It's all, again, mental. And so if it doesn't have its own, as they say, even in emptiness teachings, does not have its own inherent existence, uh, and th when it no longer is being sensed, the assumption is that it continues to exist off there in the other room or somewhere. Um, uh, my body's not there sensing it right now, but it's still there. That is an assumption because if it doesn't have its, its own presence apart from the very observation or experiencing of it, then it can't be off there. It's an imagining that it's still off there somewhere. Okay, so um, it seems to me, though, that you're kind of putting nocturnal dreams and the, sort of the dream of creation, the cosmic dream, on an equal footing in terms of their substan yeah, that's, substantiality. That's I know, admit, that's yeah, that's um, And... You know, I mean, every building and car and iPod and everything else in the world started out as a thought in somebody's head, you know, and then they kind of worked out all the details and, and you know, made something, apparent, you know, concrete or manifest. Um, and that took time, so to speak, and, uh, you know, it took prior knowledge based upon what, you know, others had discovered. And, and so there's this kind of, I don't know, it's just... I'm playing devil's advocate here, and I'm also yeah. kind of playing dummy because, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm, I'm voicing what people's obvious perspective on life is, really, which is that there is, an, uh, you know, an apparent substantiality and stability to the relative world, which we kind of rely upon. Like, you know, if you're, if you're driving across the Golden Gate Bridge, you, you, you don't want it to sort of turn into a chicken in the middle of the, you know, when you're halfway across. You know, you, you expect that it's going to remain a bridge and not be so, uh, you know, malleable as things would be in a, in a nocturnal dream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, again, that which is appearing as the Rick experience of driving over the Golden Gate Bridge, let's say, and... Even while driving over that bridge, apparently, which is all just sense perceptions, mm -hmm. uh, there's no separate bridge there, and there's no separate physical earth on which a bridge is standing, really, if you, if you break it down yeah, and look at it. Yeah, if you boil it. it down deep enough, sure. Yeah, and um, even the thought that, oh, you know, I had a nice drive over this bridge last week, too. All of that, and I've lived here in San Francisco for 30 years, whatever, and uh, all these years, you know, I've been commuting back and forth over this bridge. There is no evidence apart from a thought arising in the current moment for the whole shebang, either what appears as, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the grosser form of the bridge in that, in that instant or the, th the, the thoughts about what is assumed to have been prior experiences. 
Um, it's a little bit like... But there's sort of a consensual reality, you know, where millions of people have driven across that bridge, and there's photographs going back to the time it was built, and you can look up well, the, the architectural blueprints, and, you know, there's all this sort of agreed-upon well, stuff. All I can say is where is all of that found or going on? In the one dream or mental state that appears to be dreaming it up. And it does, that's its thing. It, as part of its dreaming, it throws in these thoughts to make it seem as if it has this continuity in time that has led up to. But it's impossible to find, again, a big part of this too is that one's premise always has to be the, the presentness of awareness. If, if the, the, that's the one who's aware and conscious. Um, and when you're sort of seeing uh, from, from, you know, as that or from this presentness only, and it's present only, um, and it's, it's all, all that is, it, even if you're going to talk about appearances, there's nothing out beyond this present awareness. So if it's all just consciousness, there's, you know, there's no physical objective stuff, but it all always, always appears to come up only on the instant. The whole package, even of, uh, you know, what claims to be back there. In, in Consciousness is all in the chapter that really goes into this. There's an example of, um, it's not perfect, but it says, okay, imagine going to a movie theater, and or just not going, but let's say, uh, think of a movie theater, and it's uh, 2013, and there's a bunch of people watching a movie, okay. Now, that audience up on the screen, there's a, you're, you're okay, uh, I'm going to back up. You are watching a movie of a bunch of people who go to the movies in 2013. Okay, so there are these people sitting in a movie theater watching, watching a movie themselves. Now, the movie they are watching is, takes place in, let's say it's a, uh, Lucille Ball or somebody in, in um, Ricky, and it takes place in 1950, okay? And let's say on, in that Lucille Ball movie, on the TV set in their living room, they're watching a gangster movie from the 1930s with Jimmy Cagney, or, or uh, what's his name, uh, Ed, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. Right. Okay, so... Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson, right. So <laughs> you've got, what have you really got? You've got like a movie within a movie within a movie or a, you know, a, a, a picture within a picture within a picture. And it seems like they're all, you know, there's this going back in time, but actually the whole thing is in that one snapshot on that one movie screen. Even all what appears to have been the successive previous uh, things, they're all in that one snapshot. And anything that we try to say about a, a prior time cannot, cannot, cannot be found apart from, uh, a per, you know, a, the same pre present snapshot. Now, this, like we were saying way back at the beginning when we first started talking, um, sometimes at first this might be thought of as a negation of something. Well, my God, this just wiped out everything. This just wiped out my whole ancestry or whatever it might be. And yet, the flip side of it, the good news is, is that the life, the awareness that's present now is absolutely free of any limitations, that any mental limitations that would seem to have gone with prior conditioning, prior habits. Uh, and we talk about getting rid of guilt when, when one's speaking as awareness, not as a human body. Um, but, you know, oh, and, and here's another thing, just while we're, while we're here. Even the thought that consciousness has been conscious before, right now, is just that, a thought. That there's been, consciousness has been around forever. Well, I'll admit, like, yeah, these things arise in the current moment, but consciousness has been here forever. It goes, you know, it's eternal. And we tend to think in terms of time. But, uh-uh, 
even that is just a thought. Consciousness is so present, so, so beautifully, screamingly free and unlimited and open and untouched, pure, just, um, it, it's indescribable. And then you get to where you can't talk. It's impossible to talk about that. And uh, one of my favorite passages, frankly, in, in Consciousness is all in the, the chapter that talks about this, chapter 22, um, it's called Time Never Began is the name of the chapter. Um, it's, uh, it uses the expression um, inexperienced God. And what is meant by that is that if you're going to say, if you're going to use the term God for this uh, infinite, present only, purity, and it's perfect because it's perfectly present. And it, as nothing has existed before, where is there any state of comparison against which, you know, this could be, this could be found wanting? Or it hasn't happened. Nothing has happened yet. It's that new. So, so where is there a, a me who has to, be, to, has to learn how to be as conscious as consciousness itself when consciousness itself hasn't had any experience in being conscious because it's just now for the first so-called time ever. It's just, it's never before. It's this, so uh, my point is this newness, newness, freshness of life without any baggage, without any uh, anything is actually your identity. You can't stop it. It can't be escaped. It can't be shut off. It can't be made to go away. And it's effortless. Hmm. Here it is. There's about half a dozen things I can throw back at you. Let's see how many I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was on a roll there. but First of all, I'm reminded of a quote from St. Teresa of Avila. She said, it appears that God himself is on the journey. Um, but um, before you respond to that, let me throw a f few more things out. Um, you, your movie analogy you know, with uh, Lucy and Ricky and then Edward G. Robinson and all, is metaphorical, and it presumes that the metaphor really does justice to the, the, some yeah. myster the mystery yeah. of creation itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and I, uh, I talked with, uh, I think it was Anita Murjani, who had this profound oh. near-death yes. experience. I don't know if you yes. saw that. I interview. watched that. I saw that one. Yeah. And um, I think one point she brought up is that this whole idea of past lives isn't linear. It is, they aren't sequential. They're happening simultaneously in the now. And so, you know, maybe it's like we human beings are like filters that give an apparent linearity to time um, yep. w to make sense out of it uh, yep. because exactly. the, the simultaneity wouldn't kind of enable us to function in a, in a r rational way. Yeah, the, the what, what the, at, speaking in terms of apparent body minds at, at the level we appear to be at right now couldn't handle that. Right. It would, it, yeah, so it gets filtered. We need a concept a of time in order to function. In fact, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi used to say, time is a concept that man uses to measure eternity. And, and again, eternity doesn't mean you know, linearly going on a long, long, long yeah. time. It means the eternal <laughs> sort of now. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, so, and right. Now, uh, Remember well, that from, from that interview, yeah. Yeah, so one other thing I want to throw in here, and that is that... Um, what, uh, you know, I'm no physicist, and I don't suppose you are either, but, you know, we have Einstein's uh, uh, twins paradox, you know, uh, relativistic time dilation, where uh, two t there are two twins, one of them stays on Earth, and the other goes out in a rocket ship, which, is approach which approaches the speed of light, and then comes back again and discovers yeah. that, you know, he's still a young man, and his twin is really old now, uh, because time has actually been dilated or stretched. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the physicists speak of space-time as if it were one sort of interchangeable... Uh, reality, and I, uh -huh. I really can't talk like a physicist or understand all the implications yeah. of that, but it does seem that on, on some level of relative reality, there is a thing called time and there is a thing called space, and there are certain uh, unusual properties that they have if you stretch them to their limits or you know move through a lot of space with you know a very short amount of time and and then space warps and things become all dilated or strange and elongated and Mm -hmm. and heavier, you know, we get weight in there where you, you begin to approach the speed of light and your weight begins to go to infinity and so, that, yeah. so then further yeah. acceleration is difficult. So, I mean, there's all these weird things that, that physicists talk about with regard to the way relative creation functions <clears throat> and it's, you know, like it or not, it probably has implications for our conversation today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it's what we appear to experience on a day-to-day -day basis is so 
unbelievably limited. Right, the tiny such peephole. A, Exactly, yeah. exactly. Just a tiny little spectrum, a slice of this pie of the spectrum mm -hmm. of, of all potential experience. Yeah, and just to piggyback what you were saying, uh, I think a physicist would say that when you get, when you work all the way through what appears as energy and form and whatever, all there is is light. And where there's just this light, they, they have a term, time zeroes out. And light implies photons, and even there, you're kind of in a manifest state. You know, yeah. it, all, it, it, it even goes yeah. deeper to sort of an unmanifest potentiality in which nothing, yeah. nothing really has arisen. But there's this kind of cosmic soup that, you know, physicists say contains a square centimeter of it contains as much energy as we see displayed in the entire manifest universe. And then there's mm -hmm. the whole thing about dark matter, you know, where 96% of what's out there in the universe we can't see because it's dark matter. And, I mean, this just boggles the mind and it goes on and on. And so, you know, in a sense, we're just kind of like, you know, taking, speculating through our little peephole here, trying, yeah. <laughs> trying yes. to make sense of it all. <clears throat> yeah, yes. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, <clears throat> trying to think of a, of a way to, to express this. Uh, you've heard stories of, maybe you have, uh, I'm going to mess this up badly, but uh, it, it, was of, it was like these, and this is a story, I think they were missionaries or something like that, oh, right. went to an island, remote island, and there were natives on there. And they arrived by boat, or at some point later, a boat showed up. But the missionaries saw it, but the natives didn't because they didn't have any Conceptual concept. framework, yeah. Yes, so it literally did not appear to them. Hmm. And in the same way in which, again, if all one is dealing with on a, on a manifest or apparent level is thought, then however it's being thought of, or in turn, you know, the, however, even, even the realm itself, however it's being thought about, is going to influence the appearance of it, the manifestation, because all there is is thought. And so the state of thought that at one time we say, if we're going we're gonna to say it happened back there, which it really didn't, when it was believed there was a flat earth, and that was, a, if, again, if it's all thought, and that was the mental state at the time, the prevalent mental state at the time, that's how it appeared. That's how it and appeared, then, but that's not how it was. Because if there had been a flat earth, the people would have not been able to live. Earth, well, earth needs to rotate, and it needs to circulate the sun, and all in, a, you know, in order for the well, solar system to work the way it does. We say that now in retrospect, but... Can it be proven that it was round beforehand? It can't. Eh, it can't. Sure. And, and yeah, the yeah. State some, of, some aliens the state could of come shock. and show us videotape that they took, you know, five <laughs> five hundred years ago, and and they can they can land and they can show the people in their little villages and say, okay, this is really five hundred years ago, and and now zoom out and here's the round Earth, and these people thought it was flat. But even all of that would be popping up in this one current. Now, Mental state. Yeah, yeah, for no. us now. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's where it gets strange is because, you know, and, and it seems as if now we could say, oh, by the way, the Earth seems to have gone from flat to round, and that hung around for 800 years or so, and 600 or whatever. And now we've got a new model in which the Earth is not a separate solid object, but just sense perceptions and it's within you you are not on earth earth is within you gives whole new meaning to earth day you know earth is your baby you're not earth's baby really uh but anyway so in one sense it could be said see there's been this progression from flat to round to now it's just all thought or perception and yet all of that so-called argument for having been a, a continuity again and a progression is found, boom, in this one thought 
coming up right now. There's nothing back there. And that's how the dream seems to do its thing. Is it, it, it creates this storyline along with the images that it, produce, it appears to produce that uh, it has this prior continuity. There's nothing prior, nothing. Hmm. Not even consciousness, again, has been before. You have, it's impossible to prove that. And if, if Anita Morjani's premise is true, that everything is happening simultaneously, all your past lives and everything else, then those people in the little villages who thought the earth was flat, they're thinking that right now. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we've kind of filtered through our human filter to assume that that <coughs> happened 500 years ago and, and now we're in the present and we're so much wiser, but there's this kind of <laughs> yeah. simultaneity of, uh, yes, yeah. it's a little, little theoretical here, but yeah, you know. and and actually, all of those people are puppets of that one whole you know Cosmic dream show. Dream. Yep. Really, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's strange. Okay, um, maybe shift gears for just a little bit, uh -huh. if you want. Yeah. When and again, this might seem a little different or radical. I would just ask for folks to keep an open thought and see if it seems to hold up. But coming back to what we were saying earlier about uh, the, the apparent universe is God's play. Mm -hmm. And part of this t ties in with, and again, these are just, uh, you know, it's in the realm of thought and concept about what one takes God to be, or the, if you want to say the divine, a state of oneness or harmony. And, um, you know, some will say, especially from, a, say, a Christian background, will say, if God is, is a God of love, God doesn't really uh, author wars and terrorism, you know, or certain, certain teachings will say that. It doesn't, you know, God does not produce war. God does not produce hate. That's all on a, on a level of ignorance, seems, seems to, where that seems to occur, uh, a lower so-called level of consciousness, whatever you want to say. Um, and so why would God produce something, you know, you can, you're going to say it's God's play, that there's war going on and chemical weapons, even though they seem to have decided to do something about it. But all, you know, blah, blah, uh, all these things that can go wrong. God produces that. What kind of God do you have? And um, anyway, a different way of looking at this is not as, and God often, often is said to be source a source or a creator, okay? Now, in another, another, let's look at it another way, just for fun, just for the sake of, of being open. If, if we're going to use a word God or the divine, whatever, or, or this which is alive is always present tense, and it's present tense only, uh, it doesn't, it, at the so-called deepest level, it doesn't experience time. It doesn't experience change. And it's all that is. So it can't be a creator because it takes time to create. Really, in to itself. You have to be standing outside to say, oh, there's creation. Not that one that is. You have to be separate from that and begin to think to begin to talk about time and creation. See what I mean? That, that's a thought thing, not a being thing. But as far as this notion of, being, of, of uh, what appears as the manifest as being caused by God or created by God, uh, I would ask everyone who's watching, since they obviously have some interest in spirituality, is it not the case that in what seems to be the time you've, say, for one of very ways saying it, been on the spiritual path, and actually, there is no back there in which you got on a spiritual path if you, if, because it's present awareness that's what you are. But just for sake of talking, it seems that there have been these shifts and changes and there's less of a sense of separation, safe to say, and less of a sense of weightiness and um, materiality, especially in light of what we've been talking about today even. But... And it, it seems like that there's more of an experiencing of consciousness, which is not material. And it's not uh, 
uh, a time flow thing. It's, it's not, consciousness is not mental either. Presence is not mental. Okay. So what seems to be happening is that this sense of separateness and the sense of, along which, which, which goes part and parcel with it, is a sense of uh, weight and heaviness and materiality and density to things. That seems to be sort of dissipating, fading out a little bit. Wouldn't, would you agree? Yeah. Experientially? I would. I would think so, right? Uh-huh. Me too. I think most of us would. Genuinely. Not that I'm going to go jumping off buildings, but exactly. there's definitely a, um, a lightness. Yeah. A, Less of that, again, sense of, I mean, because there was a time when it was seemed, seemingly, it was believed here that I am this physical body, and this is all there is to me. Right. And I'm, I'm made out of matter, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, so that seems to be fading or dissipating. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a sort of a, a life that, that one uh, apprehends in everything, animate or inanimate, a, a yeah. kind of a, an aliveness, yes. a consciousness, an intelligence, a presence, or whatever. Yes, and yeah. which was not evident earlier. No, everything seemed, seemed dead a long time ago. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, now, <clears throat> again, again... And, and that is, was very depressing. I was just thinking about that the other day, the, the time in my life when I, everything seemed bleak and dead, and it was a depressing state to be in. Now there's this just sort of bubbling bliss or a liveliness and oh, that, awesome. that yeah, just well, kind of carries on, you know. Yeah, yeah, it does its thing, yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. Now, um, again, this is this is an example. It's a metaphor, but it's the best way I, you know, I have a pointing. Let's take <clears throat> go back to a sleeping dream. Mm-hmm. When totally immersed in that dream, totally asleep, the experiences in the dream are seem very real and it seems like that's the only reality there is like we were saying earlier with your friend the geologist you know if you went up to the side of that mountain and even in the dream if you hit it with your fist you might feel something really hard there Mm -hmm. and and all the rest that goes with it so okay now let's say you start to awaken and it's in that in-between state where um you realize you are, you know, you're like half awake, half asleep still, and there might still be some of the stuff. Maybe you, there was an unpleasant part in the dream and you felt a little rumbly, and you still feel a little bit of that rumbliness, even though you know you're sort of waking up. It's still kind of lingering, and your thought might go back to it, and for a couple of seconds it feels like, whoa, yeah, that was a real, yeah, my gosh. And really, you know, even might be some emotions associated with it. Uh, but it's you're starting to awaken, and the dream is starting to fade. And then you are a little bit more awake, and the dream fades even more. And then it's kind of losing its hold. It's just, but where is it going to? Nowhere. It's just evaporating into the the nothingness that it really was anyway. And finally, you're fully awake. Maybe it's even later that morning, and there isn't even any thought of the dream anymore. Okay? So... The awakening was the dissipation of the dream, not the source of the dream, correct? The awake state was the dissipation of the dream, the fading out of the dream, not the source of the dream. And that's my analogy, is that synonymous with present awareness, what it, not my thought about it, but what it is as its own presentness right now, is fully awake and Thanks to this, and abiding as this, what seems to be the dream of Peter as a separate material entity appears to be fading too, mm-hmm. thanks to abiding that. So awareness is not the cause of that experience. It's the dissipation of it too. So it's a whole turned around way of looking at the thing. It just se- And that's why, uh, again, you know, they, they talk about... Um, Scientists will tell us the universe is expanding, and another way of looking at that is that it's, the universe is, if you're going to talk about it, is just a state of thought, really, a mental state or like a dream, and it is because, and it's, it's finite, it's limited. Even if you talk about vastness, it's still measurable and finite, but to the degree 
one is alive as the infinity of pure consciousness, pure awareness, wherein there is none of that limitation, the, the constrictedness seems to, to be falling away or, in a sense, expanding. And that's why it seem, you know, there seems to be this increase um, because of what seems to be that shift. So are you saying that the um, expansion of the universe that uh, astrophysicists talk about is somehow related to the, um, the expansion of or, or realization of the vastness of consciousness? Or yes, it's, it's it, because in that aliveness as that vastness, there one cannot simultaneously be alive as presence, consciousness right now, which is infinite, and you can't simultaneously consciously be being that and be thinking in terms of finity at the same time. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, you know, I think it's possible to maintain unbounded awareness while focusing and thinking and acting and, and doing all that stuff. I mean, and even the yogis would talk about this, where there are states of samadhi that, you know, you, the vastness alone is and consciousness alone is, but then there are more integrated states where that same state that was at one time you know, experienced with eyes closed is lived in the midst of activity. Maybe, yeah. well, maybe that's not what okay. you were saying. I don't know. Uh, it's sort of, but it's, it's as if, let's say, the activity is something that seems to be like superimposed on that. Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? It, and it's not really separate either. I don't, I don't want to make that impression. You know what I mean? It's not really, but it, it seems as if it's... It, Superimposed kind of like on a, or hap, happening within, sort of like a, a, yeah, well, a bubbling, uh, you know. Both kind of, yeah. you know, in a way. Because obviously it would have to be within, uh, although that has a kind of a spatial orientation. Yeah, 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 yeah right. But, I know how you mean. Yeah, right. but if consciousness is omnipresent and, and all that, yeah. then nothing can be sort of on top of it. Anything that's happening mm -hmm. would have, or appears to be happening, would have to be happening within it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, again, I would say... Uh, there's no evidence of a universe separate from thought and in the seeming shift from thinking, which is always limited and, and, and finite, to the unlimitedness of consciousness, there's a loosening of, of that attachment to finity, mm -hmm. the finity, the limitations of thought and the patterns, all the patterns to the unpatterned. And uh, in that, Again, this the falling. The, then it's there's nothing. Thought does not have its own presence, by itself. Only presence has presence. Mm -hmm. And if the thought is not being entertained, it ain't there. And so it can't continue to be a limiting state because it's not around anywhere to be a limiting state. True. We assume that it is, but it really isn't. That's just an assumption. And thought it, is really just a, a mental excitation. It's some kind of you know, yep. stirring up of something. Yep. Uh, but um, what I'm suggesting, and maybe this is not even a point we're debating, is, is just that, you know, mental excitations or physical excitations in the form of activity are not necessarily, they can be and, and initially are, but ultimately are not necessarily an impediment to, no, to no. you know, un, unbounded oh. awareness or consciousness. No, or no n none of what it's, it's like... There can be, uh, this is a silly little example, but, you know, on a, on a movie screen, there could be an image of uh, guys trying to lift boulders with their bare hands, and they're so heavy and massive, they can't budge them. And yet, whatever that act, and they're straining and they're sweating, and it really appears to be a physical struggle, and yet none of that keeps the screen from being the screen, ever. Correct. Ever. Yeah. Now, it may appear to overshadow the screen, and again, we're kind of limited by metaphors, but you yeah. know, so the people in the theater aren't seeing the screen, they're, they're focusing on the boulders. Exactly. But, but theoretically, you know, again, metaphors are limited, there, there could be maybe enough, enough light from behind the screen or something so that you see the boulders and you see the screen at the same time, mm -hmm. and there's no conflict between mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, another interesting thing, I've... I've sort of pondered this one uh, for a while. In terms of, again, the unlimitedness and the freedom of, of uh, self, presence, consciousness, 
which I, I use that as a as a synonym for existence. I know some others wouldn't say that. They 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 talk about the manifest too as part of existence, and that's fine. But I'm uh, when I talk about it, I'm ta- I'm talking about pure being, pure the the formless, pure is, existence. Okay. Yes. Yes. And um, any of us in a heartbeat, so called, will agree that it's impossible for existence to be blocked from existing. Right. The, the totality of consciousness, who the heck is going to shut that down? You know what I mean? It gets, it gets ridiculous. It cannot be blocked. And it's consciousness's job of being that. It's doing it perfectly. It's doing it perfectly. And it's actually not doing, doing it ongoing over, over a period of time. It's all whammo now, mm-hmm. this, this utter total unlimitedness. But in a okay. sense, consciousness seems to play hide and seek with itself, um, because in order for consciousness to become a living reality, uh, in order for t- two people to be having a conversation about consciousness, there had to be uh, some sort of manifest universe. There had to be stars. The stars had to explode and create heavier elements. Those you know, eventually had to evolve yeah. into, into biological entities. And then, and then we have a situation in which consciousness can can so to speak talk about consciousness, which initially it couldn't do. There's there's that T. S. Eliot quote about you know going through this whole process and coming back to where you began and discovering the place from the first for the first time. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. The, although that. All of that is from the finite perspective. Correct. Not from consciousness perspective. I'm just going to... From consciousness perspective, nothing ever happened. Yeah, there's just now. Right. Utter total unlimitation. Okay. So, and we keep swinging back and forth between these poles. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. And and this is, the thing is, it's present, that, that... utter and, and the the thing like you like you just said nothing ever happened before um which is another way of saying utter unlimitation no certainly no prior patterns mm-hmm. of any type right and this is true of this one right now that is presently conscious yeah now using the uh it's like the analogy of um we'll get away from the movie screen of a flat screen tv that's the popular one these days if in one scene on that TV, there's a, I don't know, maybe it's a movie uh, or a TV show about um, some kind of, uh, maybe it's a horror movie, whatever, not, not the p- most pleasant thing. <clears throat> but in an instant, and that image is there, okay, in an instant. Because the way the producers, this is where it gets imperfect. The producers, okay, it's time for a commercial. And all of a sudden, the horror movie, in an instant, switches to an image of a mom in the sunny, bright kitchen giving Cheerios to the kids for breakfast or whatever. (laughs) And there was nothing about that prior image of the movie that could keep the other from appearing on the screen. And the point is that that actually is true right now of of existence and consciousness really really but it seems and this is like trying to make excuses for it it seems on some level there's a clinging not intentional to the limitations of one scene you know uh, uh, to keep it from being whatever anything yeah and, and instantly, you know, utter total harmony everywhere because that's all there really is. And that's the only one existent. Yeah. Well, um, just a quick uh, loop back to what you're saying a minute ago, then I want to comment on this. Uh, the word Maya itself comes from Sanskrit roots, which means that which is not. So it's not like ignorance or, or illusion ever really existed. It just, you know, it, right. it, but it has no ultimate, it's not like it sort of came into existence and then we kind of worked our way through it. And that's what one realizes <laughs> right. in, in, you know, final awakening is that, oh, I never was anything other than this. I never was ignorant or lost or anything else. How, how could there ever have been anything other than this? You know, it never did yes. exist. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. but anyway, to get back to your thing about the, the horror movie and the Cheerios, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we... Uh, again, making concessions to relative reality, we are sentient beings, you know, having so-called human ex- living experience through senses and so on. We've been talking about that. And um, 
like it or not, uh, there seems to be a, a, you know, this, a structure or a, a function to the way the nervous system works, which involves not only learning so that you and I can speak English and we can't you know, instantly switch to Malayalam here or something, <laughs> um, but also the uh, accumulation of impressions, you know, which are perhaps a little bit more deep-seated yeah. and intense and binding yeah. than they needed to be just for the sake of learning. Yeah. And uh, the mere understanding that you know, some of these lofty ideas we've been discussing uh, doesn't necessarily wipe clean those impressions. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. in a sense, we're still bound exactly. by them and conditioned by them and perhaps have to work through them over apparent time in order to be free of their binding influence. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's, it's never, it's, it's always the being alive as it rather than conceptualizing about it. Correct. The, the juice is the aliveness, not the thinking about it. Yeah. Because uh, I heard you say something in one of those Time Out videos that I made it, that to me sounded like, you know, if you really get this, then you're free as a bird. You know, you've got a, oh. a, you've got a clean slate. Uh, and I thought, well, wait a minute, though. You know, it took a while to c accumulate all these vasanas, and, and you're not necessarily going to wipe them out in an instant just because you have some intellectual clarity about, you know, mm -hmm. the na nature of time and space and, or, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of gets you to the, the point of, um, you know, our practices and working with teachers and all that of any significance. And some people would argue no, because they're only going to, you know, you are, you are already that. You know, why, why do you have to do anything to become that which you already are? But it's the old mm -hmm. takes a thorn to remove a thorn, you know, principle. Yeah, 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 those are, I agree, that seems, they seem to be helpful. That's why we have workshops, you know, and, and whatnot. That's, that's why I have them. That's why I write a book. That's why I sometimes go to workshops too. Um, the the I'd say the the key thing there is there's a vast difference between going for enjoyment, so to speak, in the clarity that the the only self that there is is already at itself. Okay, it seems like there's stuff that's got to fall away whatever, but there's a vast difference between that and going, and often you hear too from, well, there are these sort of subtle implications that you're not there. You've still got to do this, do that. Do, it's, it's a, do you know what I mean? It's a yeah. subtle thing, but it's, it's a very different feel to it. But the flip uh, side of that is people running <laughs> around saying, I am there, when in fact, oh. practically speaking, they're not. Yes. <laughs> you know, in yeah. terms of actual, oh, yeah. any kind of actual living experience yeah. of that. Just. And so that can become a cop-out. Yes. Yep. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of a tricky, wick, sticky wicket where you have to kind of acknowledge the, you know, the paradoxical, you know, ultimately unreal, but nonetheless, we have to pay credence to, you know, the. the Still yeah. appear to have to, yeah. Yeah, that sure. kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and if you take a kind of rigid stance at one pole or another or, you know, and, or trying to lock yourself into an intellectual concept and think that you've, you've got the full enchilada, you can, yeah. you can hang yourself up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, let me check my iPad here and see if there's some notes of things that I didn't, uh, okay. we haven't talked about. And meanwhile, if, you, if anything comes to mind, you go ahead and uh, bring it up, okay. things we haven't covered. Uh, we talked about a lot. Yeah. Oh, one thing I was wondering about, you know, your Simply Notice book, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's all kinds of little, exer not, not exercises, but just sort of um, perspectives here about how one might notice, you know, and, uh, in ways that one is ordinarily oblivious. Um, and I just wondered if, if you meant this as some sort of a, a practice or a, an attentiveness that one should be doing throughout the day, because if so, that to me... Uh, in, Suggest that perhaps the innocent and spo innocence and spontaneity of experience might be spoiled somewhat. Yeah, you know, if you're, um, you're tying your shoes and noticing oh. I'm tying my shoes, and, <laughs> you know, you're talking on yeah. the phone. I'm noticing I'm on the phone. You know, it's yeah. a kind of a Gurdjieffian thing where they were always sort of stopping to remember the self, and you know, it was kind of a unnatural. Not yes, right. Not much fun. Yeah, th there's a uh, one place in there. I can't remember exactly where it is, <clears throat> but it says. Uh, Noticing is in some way similar to mindfulness, mm -hmm. 
but it's it's not intended as or meant as a um, uh, like a, a strict dis- disciplinary practice. Nothing wrong with being mindful, but yeah, none of not that rigid sense of oh, I've got to do this. I've got to be a perfect noticer. Uh, none none of that at all. And it um, it says it goes on to say something about it's it's like a fascination with life more that occurs spontaneously you know kind of like oh yeah oh my gosh oh rather than you know a sense of like a labored thing yeah sort of a kind of innocent gentle you know yeah exactly yeah. And like an unfolding kind of and yeah. uh, there's a lot of emphasis on that's why there's a lot of emphasis on uh, noticing the already presentness of awareness and the that it's awareness being aware and not that there's a you that's got to be aware, as aware as awareness. Mm-hmm. Uh, turning it around to kind of say, oh, yeah, my gosh, here it is. Can't make it go away <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So. There's a verse in the Vedic literature someplace that says, be easy to us with gentle effort. I really like that phrase. Oh, it, yeah, that's you know? beautiful. Yeah, it's just sort of, it that's, says it. I mean, you don't even need to elaborate. There's, and anything that departs from gentleness and turns into a kind of a struggle or a strain is is kind of a marring the the sweetness of life. Yes. Yeah. yeah totally. Hmm. Um, there's another thing you said. Maybe we've kind of covered it, uh, but maybe this will be leading us towards the kind of wrap up. Is uh, you said seeing in terms of the whole, not one little part. And I like that. There was that. What was it? Blake or, or Keats or one of those guys? Uh, infinity in a grain of sand. Eternity in an hour. Um, you know the. I believe that you know one can be living in such a way that the the wholeness can be apprehended in every little part, infinity in a grain of sand. You oh, know? I see. Uh, yeah. That you know because obviously to loop way back to the beginning, your initial point in the title of your first book, consciousness is everything. If consciousness is everything, then when I look at this book, uh, you know, I'm if I'm really seeing it as consciousness in terms of what it ultimately is, then the, the totality of everything is it's, it's holographic. The totality is contained in every part. Uh, they speak of holographic universe. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and um, anyway, it's just kind of a cool thing to, to throw in there and maybe mm-hmm. have, have some response to mm-hmm. it. Or not. Uh, yeah, in, in the book where, where it specifically talks about that, uh, I hadn't quite meant it in that broad of a sense, but that was, that was uh, wonderful the way you said it. It was... Uh, just a, if I'm recalling it correctly, that, for example, right now, this here's, here's awareness, it's aware, not thanks to something Peter is doing or Rick is doing, and with uh, the, with my, what I, we would call my attention or my senses, it's possible to focus on as I'm doing right now on the lens of the webcam that I'm looking into. Mm -hmm. And yet, while that's going on on one level or one aspect, this all-embracing awareness isn't affected one bit in its capacity to continue to be aware and be all-embracing. It seems to be something, uh, you know, that we would say a body-mind or something, again, almost like superimposed on or within this this all embracingness that appears to go on and if the identification is constantly with the the focusing and the zeroing in on only this or only that then you're you're narrowed and that's what tends to make or thoughts even that's what tends to right there create the sep- sense of a separate me and all the while the one who's really present and aware is this unfocusable uh, you know, just boundless expanse Yeah, that's alive. And one can live in such a way that that boundless expanse is one's 24-7 yeah. reality, despite yeah. the fact that one might be flying an airplane or changing a diaper or, you know, yeah. doing whatever needs to be done. Yeah, it, it can't be shut off. It can't be made to go away. It can't be made to not be. Mm. Um, in, in our workshops, I'll just toss this out real quick. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, uh, and I think one of the timeout videos, yeah, it is about this. It, it's so hard to stay in the present um, was like the title of it. And, you know, at first, that's what I, I 
struggled with that a lot at first, as I think we all do. Um, maybe not everybody, but again, when you turn it around and you know, it's turned around and it's clear, well, this, this awareness, which is functioning on its own, not thanks to anything Peter is doing, which is what we call the present, literally is the same thing. Rather than trying to get a better foothold in it as a separate me, just notice that this awareness can't not be. It can't go away. It can't escape itself. And this is the one who's here. Mm. And so there's a relaxing and, you know, an ease there. You were talking a little while ago about, you know, if uh, God is, you know, is God responsible for wars and all that stuff? And you refer, you reference the Christians, and the Christians, of course, I, at some point, they say, you know, God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. And, of course, if, if they're going to stick to that, then, you know, God is all-pervading and there's nothing which is not within God and that God is not ultimately responsible for. But um, I was reminded of a beautiful quote from the Chandogya Upanishad, which I just looked up. It says, uh, the little space within the heart is as great as this vast universe. The, mm. he the heavens and the earth are there, and the sun and the moon and the stars. Fire and lightning and winds are there, and all that now is and all that is not. For the whole universe is in him, and he dwells within our heart. Hmm. And not only does he dwell within our heart, but that's just the place where it's most easy to first locate him. But yeah. he dwells everywhere. And so ultimately, one, you know, the whole universe is contained within every part of yeah. it, within every yeah. bit. It's a holographic universe. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh... This is great fun. Could do this all day. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Good, really. I don't know. Yeah. We've been talking for a while, yeah. Yeah, nearly. You don't even just... Yeah. It goes. As Kermit the Frog says, time's fun when you're having flies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's wrap it up. Um, okay. You coming to the SAND conference? You know, I'm not this year. I just felt like taking a break. All right. Well, so, I'll be I'll be out just, there and uh, yeah, I'm sure you will be. Yeah, I'm seeing miss seeing the that the 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 talks are wonderful, but as you know, it's just such a nice atmosphere. Yeah, just the sort of in, interacting with all these people who are you know yeah. flesh and blood, not just pixels on a screen. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Especially for you. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah, see that. That's great. Okay, so the, let me make some concluding remarks. Uh, First of all, thanks a lot, Peter. This is really oh, likewise, a, Rick. Thank you very much. Really uh, fun conversation. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. I hope I haven't talked too much. I sometimes, <laughs> that. but I feel pretty settled today. No, usually, usually great. I talk too much when I get all kind of stirred up and excited, and I'm feeling kind of mellow. And hopefully, there was a good balance. Yeah, I thought so. Good. I thought it was a very good exchange. Yeah. Okay, okay so um, I'll just make some concluding remarks. So I've been talking with Peter Ju Jubin. Um, D-Z-I-U-B-A-N, it's spelled. And uh, I'll, as always, I'll be linking to his website from his page on batgap.com. And you might be watching or listening to this interview in a number of ways. You can get it on your TV through YouTube, and you can get it on your iPhone, and you can get it through a podcast, and there's so many different ways. But uh, if you, if you want to sort of you know, check out Peter in more detail and also check into the whole uh, list of uh, interviews I've already done, go to bathgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Is that an endorsement you just got? Yeah, it's a vote of, of confidence. <laughs> okay, we'll get them. <laughs> um, and so there on Batgap you'll find all the interviews that have been done listed both um, alphabetically by the people's first names and chronologically. There's a page, a menu you can pull down where you find a chronological listing. There's a discussion group there under the forum link. There's a link to the audio podcast, the Apple iTunes podcast. Uh, there's a donate button, which I appreciate and depend upon people clicking uh, from time to time. Um, and there's a tab where you can sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. So feel free to check all that out. Um, thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you next week. And I believe, no, next week is a, a Swami in San Francisco who's an expert in Kashmir Shaivism. And the week after that is David Godman, who wrote all those great books about Ramana Maharshi. And, and oh, so, my gosh. Yeah. 
So thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you next time.